Hello everyone and welcome back to Nathrin Deer's Guide to Everything and welcome back to The Legend Forge. This is a series where we take characters from pop culture, uh, whether that be movies, TV shows, games, anime, whatever it might be, we try and mould those characters and their abilities into the D&D format. And this week we have Jin Sakai from Ghosts of Tsushima, the ghost himself. Um, I played the game and I absolutely loved it and this is kind of to celebrate the release of the PS5 remaster and the release of the Iki Island DLC um, we've got some coverage of all of the armor sets all of the weapons that he uses and loads of really really fun stuff to cover and I'm actually panicking a little bit for time here because there's so much to talk about i've made so many homebrew items um, and i hope the kind of the effort shows off please feel free to like comment and subscribe we're approaching 200 subscribers really really quickly now it seems like only a minute ago we were approaching 100 so thank you so much for the support and like i said leave a like and a comment with anything you want to see in the future let's just go into dnd beyond shall we of Clan Sakai has saved lives and ended wars. So here in my characters, you can see I've made the ghost, Jin Sakai. We're going to go to edit and I'm going to show you what I've done. I don't want to spend too much time on this section, the actual class section, because the really fun stuff is in all the items that I've made. So I'd rather focus and, you know, keep most of the time for that. But we've gone for a variant human at the gate and it's just for that feat because it's just too good to pass up. And our ability scoring is one for dexterity and wisdom. Uh, Dexterity, because the class we're using, the mixture of classes we're using, primarily uses dexterity as its ability score. And again, but these items could be used by any character, really, as well. And the wisdom is there to represent Jin's journey from the start of the game to the end. The feat that we've actually gone for is one I've never used before, and it is Slasher. We can increase our dexterity or strength to a maximum of 20, and once per turn we hit a creature that deals slashing damage, you reduce their speed by 10 feet. Now, primarily, uh, Jin is using his katana and the tanto in game, so I thought this was perfect. Basically, if we deal a crit as well, the other creature has disadvantage on all attack rolls moving forwards, which is incredible. Uh, really good for a slasher character. Classes, there's a lot. There's four. Now, we've gone for a way of the Kensei monk. Um, proficiency is in acrobatic stealth and the flute. Uh, we do get unarmored defense, and there's going to be basically optional ways to play this character because I've made so many armor sets, but obviously monks don't do too well with armor. But you can play him kind of as the ghost, kind of a lighter build that moves around the battlefield quickly, or an absolute tank with plate armor and such. Again, we'll get into that in the future. So the monk we went for generally because you get the dedicated weapon stuff, the kind of key which you could flavor as your resolve from the game, the little circle bars that kind of come up in the, in the bottom left. They used to heal you and fuel some of your abilities as well. With dedicated weapon, that means we are proficient in weapons we wouldn't be as a monk as well, like long swords slash a katana we get deflect missiles which is just an awesome monk ability we never get hit by bows and things the path of the kensei we've gone for a painter's supplies i didn't know what else to go for if there was like haiku writing then probably something like that because that's what you do in the game but there wasn't so you know we settle uh, and a long sword and a long bow as our proficiencies there we get quickened healing which is an optional class feature which again literally you can just flavor as using key points to get your health back or using resolve like in the game for our ability score improvement level four we went for a double into dexterity uh, we get slow fall and it's that supernatural ability in games to not take as much fall damage as you probably should at fifth level we get an extra attack at fifth level we also get stunning strike should we need it key empowered strikes means we can punch ghosts basically magical ma magical fists our speed is increased with unarmored movement if we're not wearing armor 
and we also get at 6 level 1 with the blade which is another kensei feature which actually makes any non-magical strikes they would become magical and we can use the death strike feature as well when you hit a target with a kensei weapon you can spend one key point to cause the weapon to do extra damage to the target equal to your martial arts die now there's going to be a theme running here of just stacking extra damage depending on what armor you're wearing because that's what the armor sets do in game some give you increased health some give you increased damage some give you increased stagger which isn't really a thing in DD. i've tried to represent them the best i can though at seventh level we get evasion uh, we only take half damage if we succeed on a dexterity saving throw against an aoe effect a stillness of mind we can end one charmed or frightened effect and i think this comes again from the samurai training that Jin has had through most of his life being able to just stay stay firm against even the greatest odds at eighth level we've gone for another feat and we've actually gone for sharpshooter so that any of our ranged weapon attacks like with the longbow the shortbow or the kunai that we use we can use this feature to minus five to the attack roll for extra damage on top which again the kunai you use a lot in game they're very very good tools and um, i really like doing like a bow build in game as well so i had that in mind there we've gone for four levels in fighter and the fighting style we've gone for archery just so we get those bonuses to ranged weapons we get second wind action surge i won't go too much into those we get an extra action on the turn with action surge and second wind means we can heal a little bit what well, a martial archetype we've gone for battle master because samurai are battle masters without a doubt and with that comes combat superiority which means we get some maneuvers in battle uh, as a student of war i went for a cook's utensils proficiency no idea why didn't know what else to choose in this particular one for our maneuvers we've gone with parry a huge mechanic in the game and parry essentially allows us it's what it sounds like we can use our reaction to spend one superiority die to reduce damage on an attack plus our dexterity modifier again while we're leaning into that dexterity it's going to be really really important for the whole build basically we've also gone for menacing attack to lean into the terrify feature of a lot of Jin's abilities in game when he becomes the ghost and he starts assassinating people and things a lot of the other enemies the mongols in this case tend to kind of run in fear when we hit them and we can expend a superiority die to deal some more damage as well uh, rounding out the maneuvers we have ambush when we make a dexterity stealth check or an initiative roll we can expend one superiority die and add the die to the roll provided you aren't incapacitated and ambush i would actually try to probably reflavor this as the standoff feature that's within the game where you announce yourself to your opponents and then i would say you get an initiative advantage or you always go first for at least a round that rounds out our maneuvers and then finally for an ability score improvement in the fighter we've gone for double into constitution again just to uh, round out Jin's journey across the course of it you do get extra items to give you more health and you find charms and all these things in the world all these collectibles we went for oathbreaker paladin and now this is to represent Jin going against his samurai code uh, and I think it fits really, really well. Uh, not so much the divine features of detecting demons and undead and things like that, because that's not really anything that's a part of the game. But lay on hands, again, you could flavor as using your resolve in a pinch to be able to just heal yourself a little bit. We get some, we get a fighting staff, which we've got with Great Weapon Master. So anything we're wielding in two hands, we can not roll the lowest, essentially. We can choose to roll again on some of the damage die. We get a bit of spell casting, which we've flavored all as ghost weapons and things like that. Harness Divine Power is an optional class feature. We can essentially get some spell slots back. Uh, our Divine Health makes us immune to disease. Uh, you don't really catch any diseases or anything during the course of the game, so that's really, really good we're resistant to the mongols poisons and things like that for our oath we've gone for oath breaker as i mentioned which means we get some oath breaker spells again to represent this transition into the ghost i think the a great aspect of this is this dreadful aspect feature here again talking about terrifying your enemies with what you are when you become the ghost as an action the paladin channels the darkest emotions and focuses them into a burst of magical menace each creature within 30 feet must make a wisdom save or become frightened of you so really 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 good and a lot of our items that I've built mean we deal bonus damage to frightened enemies as well. For the ability score improvement, we want to double dip into wisdom. Uh, fifth level, we get an extra attack, but again, we've already got one, so it doesn't really give us anything extra because we've got the first one from the monk. And finally, to round out the class, we have three levels in rogue. That's to give us expertise in acrobatics and stealth, which he absolutely has. It's very easy to sneak around in the game. It's one of the best ways to play. That gives us sneak attack of course we get advantage when we're trying to assassinate particular creatures and 
cunning action means we have that gaming mechanic of being able to jump in, jump out, roll away uh, whenever we get into any trouble. For our archetype, we have gone for the assassin, specifically for the assassinate feature, because we're going to be using that a lot, especially if you take on that more ghost playstyle. All these classes are designed to kind of put you in the middle. If you wanted to play more of the fighter build, more of the samurai, you can lean more into the fighter uh, samurai build or the monk way of the kensei and leave out completely the oathbreaker paladin should you choose to and go more that way or you can go for this you know this assassin we're going somewhere down the middle because they literally just would not have time to make all the different variations you could do of this character yeah assassinate gives us a crit if something hasn't taken its turn in combat or they're surprised so yeah wonderful that rounds that out for our ability scores we've gone for a custom one that i decided to go for i think it seems right because he's a well-rounded guy 14 strength 16 dex 14 constitution 10 intelligence 13 wisdom and 14 charisma now we're going to jump straight into the items our background is noble by the way should you need it so out the gate you can see this is our statistics we've got because of that expertise, we get 17 acrobatics, 17 stealth on pluses, which is just ridiculous. Our saving throws are fantastic, and our stats across the board are fantastic for a melee fighter. What I've done with the items is try to make it as customizable as possible, so you can go for any build that you could feasibly make within the game. Now, if we jump over to our inventory, you can see we can only attune to three items. So I've tried to make the things that he uses all the time, like the sword and stuff, non-attunable and we buff their effects with the armors which are attunable the armors and the, the the bonus items around it so currently we've gone for what i wear more the most in game which is like a traveler's cloak to find items um, and to still be deadly when sneaking uh, the flavor text is there for you i'll read this one but probably not all of them again it's gonna take too much time but once belonging to a stoic lord who survived a battle with a deadly enemy to save his people and reclaim his honor he became the ghost while wearing this cloak you can make it billow dramatically at will so it's a cloak of billowing we love that and while attuned to this cloak you have advantage on intelligence investigation and wisdom perception checks to find valuables and magical items we also have the graceful pathfinder feature Additionally, as an action, you can cast Locate Object and Detect Magic from this cloak once each. Once used, these properties can't be used again until the next dawn. So this is a really good one if you're just doing some exploring in the world. Moving up one further, a short blade perfect for assassinations and paired with the Sakai Katana. Together the blades are known as the Sakai Steel. So this Tanto is the primary short blade that Jin uses across the course of the campaign. And this Tanto is considered a ghost weapon and you'll see why that comes into use in the future we have a few items that amplify its effects in the game his weapons aren't particularly magical or crazy or do any ridiculous things so i didn't want to give them like flaming blades or anything like that we're just going really basic with i guess physical features something that changed the way you move or uh, kind of interact with your environment in the game and that's why it's not a plus three because it's not like a god killer or anything although in theory, you could still kill a god with this kind of thing. And we have the Shadow Strike feature. While wielding only this weapon, if you have advantage on an attack roll against a creature and hit, as part of that attack chain, you can choose to embody the ghost. If another creature is within 15 feet of your first target, you can dash towards them at no movement cost and make another attack. You can't target the same creature more than once, and the amount of times you can chain this effect is equal to your dexterity modifier. So currently that's at 5 for us. Once the Shadow Strike effect has resolved, you may use any remaining movement speed and then your turn immediately ends. Once used, this property cannot be used again until the next dawn. So the Shadow Strike feature is really, really fun. It's something that uh, in the Tsushima Legends mode, the Assassin has, where you can kind of dart between targets. But this is a really fun way to build some utility into the Tanto itself. Moving swiftly on, we go to the Ronin Straw Hat, worn by those who live and die by the bow and blade. Your dexterity score increases by one, as does your maximum for that score. You get the refined predator feature. When you make a dexterity stealth check, you can treat a d20 roll of nine or lower as a 10, so similar to a reliable talent from a rogue. Additionally, when you make a melee ranged attack against a creature and you have advantage, on a hit you do an additional 2d6 of the weapon's damage type. So the Ronin Straw Hat is primarily used in the game. It gives you stealth buffs and more melee damage. So I figured, how can I work that in? One of the skins was called Refined Predator. I thought that summed it up beautifully. So it's kind of a roguish type element to this particular item. Next up, we move up to the very rare items, which a couple of these lower ones would be. Um, we go for the Tsushima Kunai. 
skillfully wielded by a stoic lord, blah 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 blah, flavour text. These kunai are considered ghost weapons, there's another ghost weapon. You have a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls made with these magical weapons. We have serrated blades. If you hit a creature with this weapon, they must make a con save, DC 15. On a failure, until the end of their next turn, they can only take one action or one bonus action. Additionally, they can't take reactions, their movement speed is halved. On a success, they suffer none of these effects. So I was trying to find a way, rather than just keep doing more damage, more damage, more damage, to make some of these features interesting. So with the kunai, I noticed one of the features was serrated blades, which in the game does more damage, but a bit boring. I figured I'd d and d it and make it so that essentially if they try and move, it kind of moves around and wiggles in them if it's stuck in their body, reducing their movement speed and mean they're just not as mobile. And obviously you would have probably, I don't know, 10 of these at a time, probably quite expensive to source in the world, in your world, wherever you want to use these. Next up, we have the famous flute that he plays in game, which has the ability to control weather and kind of lead him on the right path. And in the Iki Island DLC, the new stuff, you can actually befriend animals with it as well, a little mini game, which just looks really, really cute. It's his late mother's Shakuhachi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a flute with an attunement to nature. And as I mentioned, we can use an action to cast Animal Friendship, find the path, and control weather. Once the instrument has been used to cast a spell, it can't be used again to cast that spell until the next dawn. The spells use your spell casting ability and spell save DC. Lovely, nice and simple. Again, very attuned with the game. Nothing too ridiculous, but without a doubt, a very rare item and doesn't require attunement. Something to note there. Moving on now, we go to we get to a pair of hakama, so which are the kind of the long dress breech type things that they, in Japanese culture they wear on the lower half traditionally. Um, so this one is worn by a legendary ronin, claimed by a lord by defeating the six blades of Kojiro, ending with a momentous duel on the mirror of sacred light. Which it's a side quest in the game. Do it, do it, do it. If you're playing the game, it's incredible. One of my favourite parts of the entire game was the six blades of Kojiro arc. We have a feature called Pure Reckoning, and these do require attunement, by the way. While attuned to this Hakama, you gain the following benefits. Your Wisdom score increases by 2, as does your maximum for that score. If you hit a creature with a melee attack with a long sword, you can choose to deal an extra 6d8 slashing damage. Once you've used this property, it can't be used again until the next dawn. So that's just that very deadly single strike that a kensei would be able to make and these six blades that you first they all have different fighting styles but they're all very deadly with their blade i figured this leans into that the katana is a very very deadly weapon in the right hands this also gives us another feature ghost weapons are more effective if you hit a creature with a ghost weapon you can roll an additional damage die of the weapon's damage type this effect does not stack with other equivalent effects so this feature does appear on more than one of the items i've created here so in this case, our Tanto and our Kunai are both considered ghost weapons, so you could roll one additional damage die when calculating damage for those particular items, as long as you're attuned to the Hakama. I hope that makes sense, stay with me. We're now moving on to the Adachi Clan Breastplate, which is one of the first sets you actually get in the game. Um, and this is from uh, Lady Massacre's questline, another fantastic one, would recommend it. Sturdy armor that once belonged to the son of the sole survivor member of Clan Adachi. You have a plus two bonus to AC while wearing this armor. It is a breastplate and it does require attunement. Massacre's Resolve is the feature. While attuned to this armor, you gain the following benefits. Your constitution score increases by one, as does your maximum for that score. When you take damage, you can reduce the amount of damage taken equal to your constitution modifier. So this is given at the start of the game as a very, very good defensive set for those struggling with the combat in the game itself. So it gives you a little bit more health and means you just take less damage overall. Really, really solid. I think it absolutely is worthy because of that extra plus two to your AC of being in the very rare category should you choose to put this into your games. Continuing on, we get to the legendary class. And we get to Tadayori's armor, which is the archer themed one within the game. And this is a legendary set. This mythic armor was bestowed as a divine gift first to one of the greatest archers to ever live, then given as a gift to our character, to Jin Sakai. Now, a plus three bonus to AC while wearing this armor, and this is light leather armor. And we have the Flowers of War feature. While attuned to this armor, you gain the following benefits. Your dexterity and wisdom scores increase by one, as does your maximum for those scores. You gain expertise in perception. And if you're wielding a bow, as a bonus action, you can take an additional ranged attack on your turn. If you hit a creature, that attack deals an extra 1d8 piercing damage. 
So if you're going for a bow build, an archery themed build, this is it. This is the armor you want. I love using it in game, but very, very effective and keeps you light on the battlefield as well. Now we go on to the Sarugami Breastplate, which is actually an armor set that's in the Iki Island DLC. There's not too much about it, but I think I got the general gist of what it does. I haven't, I haven't played that part myself yet. So it's said to be imbued with the power of fearsome monkey spirit, pushing its owner to embrace risk and danger. Yeah, so Sarugami's Wrath is the feature, and while attuned to this army, you get the following features. The dexterity score increases by 2, as does your maximum for that score. Your constitution score decreases by 2. You have advantage on dexterity saving throws. You have advantage on wisdom insight checks to determine the deadliest creature you can see passively at the start of a combat encounter. While in combat initiative, you are compelled to do everything you can to get within melee range of the perceived deadliest creature. So Sarugami's breastplate and this, I guess, this thing is sort of that risk versus reward. The spirit is said to encourage taking risks in battle for your own betterment during it if you can time things correctly, if you are dexterous enough, basically. If you can see a creature that targets you for a melee or spell attack, they have disadvantage on the attack roll. Everyone has disadvantage. This is powerful. If a creature misses you as a result and is within melee range, you can immediately make a melee attack against them, dealing an additional 2d10 damage of the weapon's damage type. Your alignment changes to chaotic good, if it wasn't that already. So you become a little more chaotic, for lack of a better word. You're a little weaker constitution-wise, but you can deal some serious damage. What this does in-game is actually increase your parry window time as well as your dodge window time. Next up we have the longbow of Ichitsune, and this is a more simple one. Some say this bow awaits a worthy master, others believe it still holds the demon's curse. Read into that a little bit more should you choose, it's a really fun bit of lore. You have a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. And it is haunted by demons, and that's our feature. If you hit a fiend with an arrow shot from this bow, it deals an additional 2d8 radiant damage. If you reduce a fiend to zero hit points with this bow on the material plane, you learn that creature's true name. So again, this is about as high fantasy as it gets within the main story of Ghost of Tsushima, talking about this particular demon. So I thought I'd lean into the bow here and make that the primary way to, I guess, yeah, just make it more more D&D-like and actually useful. We have Gosaku's Unbreakable Plate. The story says this armor can turn even a simple farmer into a warrior. So this is a legendary set. It does require attunement. This suit of armor is reinforced with adamantine, which means you cannot be crit. You have a plus three bonus AC while wearing this armor. It is plate armor, so it's already absolutely monstrous. And we have the unbreakable feature. While attuned to it, our strength and constitution scores increase by two, as does our maximums for those scores. And if you reduce a creature to zero hit points with a melee attack, you regain hit points equal to your constitution modifier. Again, very simple, very effective. It makes you an absolute tank and you're recovering hit points whenever you kill anything which you absolutely will be doing a lot of because next up we have the Sakai Katana so it's a perfectly balanced impossibly deadly katana and when paired with a Sakai Tanto together the blades are known as Sakai Steel you have a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon and we have the warrior's code which means we can adopt the stances that are found in the game so that's the stone stance the water stance the wind stance and the moon stance the stone stance is specialized for fighting against human swordsmen in the game or just aggressive foes. So if you come up against a creature like that that's not using a shield and you're holding the weapon in two hands, you deal an additional 1d10 slashing damage. Or you can adopt a stance by using a bonus action as well, by the way. In stone stance, you can also use a piercing strike. You can prepare for someone to attack you. So you can hold your blade up high and get ready for someone to come at you. Then you can unleash. Instead of doing your normal attacks on your turn, you can hold an action and do 4d10 to one specific creature. Really, really powerful. In Water Stance, it's specialized for combat against defensive foes, and the idea is you overwhelm them with strikes. So we have an additional 1d8 slashing damage against shielded foes, and we have the Downpour feature, which means we attack them with a flurry of strikes, throwing them off balance. If you hit a humanoid creature that is wielding a shield, you push them five feet, regardless of what their save would be. As long as they're not, you know, huge creatures, the DM can determine what wouldn't be pushed, I think. If you hit the same target with two or more melee attacks on the same turn, they must make a strength saving throw DC 15, and a failure they are knocked prone and can't be pushed any further. On a success, they are not knocked prone, but each subsequent successful hit after the second, the DC increases by two. So if they succeed on the first one and you manage to get a third attack in, they have to do it again. So action surge and extra monk attacks all come into this beautifully. 
Now we have the Wind Stance, which is specialized for combat against foes equipped with melee weapons with the Reach property. You must be wielding this weapon with two hands to enter Wind Stance, that's the same as the Stone one. So, if a humanoid creature targets you for a melee attack and they're wielding the weapon with the Reach property, so spears, glaives, things like that, they have disadvantage on the attack roll, straight up. If their attack misses, as a result, you can immediately use a reaction to move towards them and make a melee attack with advantage. If you hit, you deal an additional 2d10 slashing damage. So that comes into the, the counter that you can do against spear-wielding enemies within the game itself. In Wind Stance, you can also use the Typhoon Kick feature. We can wind up and launch ourselves towards a target with a deadly kick. As an action, you can unleash a single powerful kick towards a creature within 10 feet and make an unarmed strike. If you hit, instead of a normal unarmed strike damage, it deals 3d8 and they have to make a strength saving throw DC18 or be pushed 15 feet away and knocked prone. Last up for the Sakai Katana, we have Moon Stance. And this is another one-handed themed uh, stance, although he does use it in two for some swings in the game. I thought I'd go for one of each, basically. And this is designed to deal with large creatures. We do an additional 1d8 slashing damage to anything that is large or bigger, size category-wise. And we have the Tornado feature on here as well. You assail nearby foes with three fast spinning strikes. As an action, you rapidly spin to deal damage to all nearby creatures. Each creature within five feet must make a dexterity save and throw DC 18. On fail save, the creature takes 68 slashing damage and its movement speed is halved until the end of its next turn. This can only be used once per day as well because that's a very powerful feature being able to attack everything around you, especially if you're being swarmed. So yes, nothing particularly magical about the sword, but my god. A lot of features, a lot to know, but I think it would add a really, really fun bit of utility to all your combat encounters if you could change stances on the fly to deal with all different kinds of enemies. Two more items to go, and I can see the timer ticking up here. This is probably going to go over half an hour. What are you going to do? Destined for battle, this armor is jet black and emblazoned with the crest of the Sakai clan, one of the famous armor sets from the game. This is a plus three breast breastplate, uh, a magical set of armor, and we have the ghosts from the past feature. While attuned, we gain the following benefits. Your dexterity or strength score increases by one, as does your maximum for that score. Your constitution score increases by one, and your charisma score also increases by two, as does your maximum for those scores. So really huge buffs across the board here. As an action, you can cast Enthrall, DC 20, and if you hit a creature with an attack under the effects of the spell, they take additional damage equal to 1d10 of the weapon's damage type that you're using. You can cast this spell twice, and then it resets on a long rest and then we can also cast fear again leaning in to this terrify feature that you have when you're wearing some of this armor when you kill something they tend to just run away from you in fear because you're just so deadly and so scary to them so in thrall you can kind of bring them into this standoff with you and as you strike them you deal more damage really really fun Additionally, while wearing this armor, if you roll for initiative, you can treat a roll of 14 or lower as a 15 flat. So you can only roll, you can't roll any less than a 20, basically, with our current initiative bonus. Last but not least, another pretty long one, we've got the ghost mask. Now, it's not the full set of ghost armor. I thought I'd just go for the mask so you guys can chop and change with uh, different bits of armor should you want to mix a couple of the items together. That's how it's designed to be used to maximize a certain playstyle like you can in the game. So this is a good friend's final creation, given as a gift to a stoic lord. And this is the famous mask that you see on all the artwork within the game itself. So Executioner's Penance is the feature on this item, and while attuned to it, you gain the following benefits. Your Dexterity score is increased by 2, as does your maximum for that score. Whenever you make a Dexterity Stealth check, you can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10, so it's reliable talent coming in again there. Ghost weapons are more effective, we've gone over that feature, so that all your ghost stuff will be doing more damage. And the real bread and butter of this is the Ghost Dance. So once after killing a creature, you may choose to enter the ghost stance, which lasts until the end of your next turn. Once you use this property, can't be used again until the next dawn. And while in the stance, you gain the following benefits. If you hit a creature with a ranged or melee attack and they have 25 hit points or fewer, they die. If you cause a creature to die, the brutal nature of it has a chance to terrify those around you. Each creature of your choice that is aware of you within 30 feet must succeed on a wisdom save and throw a DC 19. Uh, so this is very similar to like a Frightful Presence um, feature from quite some of the larger creatures in the game. And essentially they have to run away from you as part of this frightened action. It's like a better version of just being frightened. And that is to, again, there's a ghost stance within the game where you just, you're basically invulnerable. Anything you hit just dies in one hit. It's really, really satisfying to do and I thought I had to include it somewhere.
If you then hit a creature that is frightened of you, you do an additional 1d10 damage on top of all the other bonuses that we've got. And during your next turn, after activating Ghost Stance, if you reduce a creature to zero hit points, the stance stays active until the end of your next turn. This effect can only happen once per usage of the Ghost Stance feature. So turn one, I kill something, activate Ghost Stance, I finish my turn comes around to my next turn I'm still in ghost stance if I kill something again it then extends to my next turn as well but then it will expire you don't get it forever but for a couple of rounds you could be an absolute killer machine especially against the lower level enemies and this is designed basically to kill those just common run-of-the-mill bandits a lot that you encounter in the game you can just annihilate them by end game and especially with ghost stance you just tear through things Okay, so now I thought we'd quickly look at the spells that we have ready for us, and these are all flavored as just abilities in-game. So we have the Black Powder Bomb, which is actually a hellish rebuke, so if you get hit by something, you can throw a bomb as a reaction, should you choose to. Black Powder Bomb is quite effective in-game, so 2d10 fire damage, pretty good. If you wanted to, you consider this a ghost weapon, uh, should your DM allow, because technically in game it is in here it's a spell D, &D we're doing what we can and um, because obviously of our armor we get bonus to ghost weapon damage so yeah this could work for that as well if you want to make it 3d 10 by all means who knows so the dance of wrath we have here is actually a vampiric touch i believe flavored as that anyway and what you can do is you can make a melee spell attack against a creature and they take 3d 10 necrotic damage i would just flavor this as what it is in the game dance of wrath is three quick very very heavy attacks that cannot be blocked i believe so you could just flavor it as that we've got the standoff feature which actually is a compelled duel you bring something in towards they have to fight you we have the way of the flame feature from the game which is actually you just ignite your sword and this is a the searing smite spell should you need to research exactly what it does it is fire damage on a hit basically We've also gone for Fine Steed, so you've got Fine Nobu, Sora, or Cage, um, and obviously they are the names of all the horses that you can pick at the start of the game. I went for Sora, if that makes any difference, I think it's cool. It means Sky. Uh, but yeah, Fine Steed, perfect. We have the Crown of Madness, which I flavoured as the Hallucination Dart, so you can turn a humanoid against one of their friends. We also have Heavenly Strike, which is another smite spell, and this is Branding Smite, I believe, and that deals an extra 2d6 radiant damage. Um, so that is, again, obviously in-game, you can kind of slash forwards in an arc and deal extra damage to an opponent. The heavenly name of it just gave me an idea to make it this spell, essentially. I think it fits, again, really, really perfectly. We've also got this Darkness spell, which you could do as a smoke bomb. Really, really good idea, again. Um, and this is all about, you know, it's all about, you know, how you see things, how you explain it while you're casting one of these spells. You say, my character pulls, uh, Jin Sakai pulls a small cord out and it's a smoke bomb as opposed to a ball of magical darkness. We've got find the path that comes from the Shakuhachi flute, which means you can just find out where you need to go. And the massive eight level spell control weather, because um, you can basically change seasons. It goes to Tsushima. Very powerful. I mean, you're level 20. Who cares? It's fine. So with that, that rounds out the spells and some of the kind of ghost weapons and other abilities that you get in game that I've encompassed with our spell list here. Thank you for the Oathbreaker Paladin. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. That's, I'm going to have to call it the end of the video here. There's loads of different builds you can do. I can't imagine a DM will let you have all of these items. So just try and convince them on at least one uh, if you can. It should be fairly balanced. I've really thought about the balance behind these items. And if I've broken anything, please let me know in the comments. Um, I'm sure I have. Um, I'm not a game designer after all. But yeah, uh, this was really, really fun to make. I hope you guys enjoyed this and I hope you this fulfills all your fantasies of playing a samurai or Jin Sakai specifically in one of your home games um, and hopefully you put these items to good use if you want to find them you can just search bracket ngte bracket and you'll see all my homebrew items there or you can search for something specifically in the homebrew section on DD beyond that's it like comment and subscribe if you haven't already we're so close to 200 um, that's it the ghost Jin Sakai see you next time Bye-bye.